Good afternoon. Well, I know the 3 o'clock time slot's a bit difficult. Your mind is probably wandering towards coffee. I know mine is. But before you get up in search of coffee, I'd like you to reconsider. I mean, maybe you're thinking you're from a landlocked city, and you don't need to worry about the issue of sea level rise. But I can assure you that what happens in the coastal cities is going to affect all of us. It'll disrupt the activity at the ports, the energy facilities, the airports, all the goods and services we receive from them. On the other hand, maybe you're from a coastal city, and you think, here's another scientist who's going to sound the alarm and show us a bunch of data and graphs, and I've heard all this before. I don't need to hear more about this problem of sea level rise. But what I'd like to do today is to take the time to move beyond the science of sea level rise and start to embrace this concept of redefining our relationship to the coastline and accepting the idea that our coastlines are going to be on the move, not just for the next decades, but for the next several centuries and even many millennia into the future. And the sooner that we start to have this longer term conversation, the better we're going to be at developing pathways towards adaptation. So as a geologist, this long-term perspective is what I bring to the table today and that I would like to impart to you. So still, if you're a bit sleepy, I've decided to put my, all my conclusions up front so that you can get the crux of it at the beginning. So there are three key messages I want you to know. The first is, and I don't have to argue this very much standing here in Miami, is that sea level rise is happening now. It's not just a figment of our imagination or something that we think might happen in the future or be a problem. We're already seeing the effects of this in cities across the globe today. This is a picture from the natural high tides that occur seasonally here with people wading through the water, which this past time, just this last week, was in some places a few feet deep because of the combined storm surge swell offshore, heavy rains, and the king tide, a trifecta that I'm sure will occur again in the future. But not only is it happening now, but we're certain that it's going to continue and that it will continue for a very long time. And I'll show you some of the evidence for that. Second key message is that unlike a storm surge, sea level is going to be here to stay. So Hurricane Matthew came along and grazed our coastline in Florida a few weeks ago. And in the city of Jacksonville, the ocean breached the dunes and the waters flooded into the streets. And the video footage was really quite astounding. But those floodwaters have receded now, and people are moving back to their homes and getting on with their lives again. But the sea level rise that we see is going to be permanent on human timescales and even on the timescale of our civilization. So while it might seem very slow, it's persistent, and its effects will probably be felt faster than you think. So I can't get away from showing one or two graphs, but it's only going to be two today. And this is one of them. It's the only sea level rise projection I'll show. It's a very stock lock and barrel one. It shows they're estimating something like two feet of rise by the year 2060 in this area, which is what they've been planning for. But if we're wading around in two feet of water today during the king tides, and we have another two feet by 2060, now we're up to four feet, and my six-year-old is completely under the water. So what I can do is I can guarantee to you, and that's not a word you hear a scientist say often, but I can guarantee that sea level rise will not look like this graph as we move into the future. It will not be a smooth, continuous rise. It will be punctuated by extreme events, which will be superimposed upon this rising base level. So we're going to feel the effects of sea level most distinctly during these extreme events, the high tides, the storms, and the hurricanes. And that's when push is going to come to shove. Third key point, and I apologize to Michael Bloomberg, who used this phrase this morning. I didn't know he was going to say that, so if he's in the room or if he's not, this is not about saving the planet, right? I'm a geologist. Planet Earth has been here for about four and a half billion years. I'm not worried about the planet disappearing. It's going to survive this. The question is, will we? Right? I mean, we can do this exercise where you all close your eyes and I say, what's the first image that pops into your head when you think of the word environment? And you might think of trees or mountains or water. But in any of those images, did you see people? Right? The question is, how can people coexist within this environment? This issue is primarily, to me, about human lives and taking people out of harm's way. It's a human health issue. Look at this person wading through the streets again here in Miami during the king tides. Think about waterborne diseases of cholera that's in Haiti right now. 
What about the delivery of fresh water as these salt waters intrude into our freshwater aquifers? What about removing sewage waste without it getting into the floodwaters? What about all the standing water and Zika transmission, right? This is profoundly a human health issue. It's, sea level rise is not just about flooding of land, which is what a lot of people think about. There are a lot of other issues compounded on top of it. So those are the three key messages, but there's an overarching one, too, that I don't want to forget, and that is that there is hope. I'm not an alarmist, and there's a lot of doom and gloom, and you can get yourself very depressed about this issue, but there is hope. We can make a difference and do something about this. And when I think about this, I like to show these images because I get goosebumps every time when I see these images or I even think about them, right? So this was a Herculean task. We put a man on the moon, not because it was a matter of life and death, but because we wanted to. It was through sheer will and hope and human innovation. That combination of things, they are our greatest renewable resources in this day and age. But they won't be worth much unless we decide to be proactive. Because if we wait until the day after Hurricane Sandy to worry about what's going to happen next time, if we wait till the day after Hurricane Katrina, the day after the King Tides, then we're one day too late in implementing the solutions, much less talking about them. So let's step back for a moment and think about what we know about sea level rise so that you can understand my perspective and then we can carry that forward to talk about some solutions. So when we look at the tide gauge, re gauge records over the past century or so, it's unquestionable that sea level has risen. And today, the rate of sea level rise is on the order of about three millimeters a year. So that's not a very impressive sounding number, right? And it's a really hard one to work with when we're doing public communication. Three millimeters a year, really? I mean, that's the thickness of two pennies stacked on top of each other. So pretty people snickering in the back, thinking, oh, my beach house is fine, right? You know, I've got this. But unfortunately, small numbers of sea level rise can translate into large distances of coastline retreat. And the rates we're looking at today will be dwarfed by the rates that we're projecting into the future. Because in the next century, we expect the melting of the polar ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica to overtake this and to be the dominant contributor to sea level rise. So predicting how this is going to go down exactly, I mean, the most common question I get is, well, how quickly is sea level going to rise and how high is it going to get? That's what I need to know, right? And there's a lot of uncertainty around giving exact numbers to people like that. But what I want to tell you is that we have a great amount of certainty that it's going to happen, right? I mean, we all take out insurance on our houses on the small percentage chance that it might catch on fire because the effects would be so devastating if it did catch on fire that we're willing to put down money every month to buy that insurance, right? This is a done deal. It's going to happen. We've already warmed up the atmosphere enough. It's like we've taken these ice sheets and thrown them into a warm room, and now we're watching them melt. But how do we know how quickly it's going to unfold? Because we've never witnessed these polar ice sheets retreat like this before, and we don't even understand all of the physics involved, so it's hard for us to model it. So this is where my work comes in as a geologist, because we can go back into time and look at the geologic record and see what happened the last time it got warmer. How quickly did these ice sheets retreat, and how fast did it happen? And those are the fundamental questions that my research seeks to address. So to tell you about what I do, I've put together some photos of a field expedition we recently took down to the Florida Keys, not far from here. I study coral reefs, and fossil corals in particular. And what we do is we date the age of the time, exact time at which the coral grew, we survey its position, and we study it so that we know exactly what depth it was living in the reef, and they need to live close to the surface of the ocean to get enough sunlight. And that's how we reconstruct the position of sea level back through time. And what we were doing down in the Keys is we were drilling down through a sequence of coral reef that grew about 125,000 years ago. At that point in time, most of South Florida was underwater. It was a shallow marine setting. The rocks here in downtown Miami are the same things that are today being deposited on the Bahama Banks. And that's what we were look living in. So we're looking for evidence in these corals that stacked one on top of each other as they grew up as sea level rose. And we want to date how quickly that happened so that we can answer this question. Locally, the last time this happened, how quickly did sea level rise to help us to put some 
boundaries on these parameters. So this is some of the core that we collected while we were there, and it's chock full of beautiful corals that we're now working with. And it's going to take us some time to get the data. And unfortunately, the rates of sea level rise from these past warm periods are still very poorly constrained. So we don't have a good answer on that part of it yet. But I have been to sites around the world studying this same time period. I've been to Western Australia, Jamaica, the Seychelles, Bahamas, Mexico. You're feeling really sorry for me now, right? Um, but we have looked at all of these sites together, and we've compiled that into this summary that was published last year in Science. And I'm summarizing it in this cartoon. What you're looking at on the left is a column of sea level, which is set at zero. That's today, where we're sitting. We've ramped up carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by more than 150% of what it was in the pre-industrial period. That's the green bubble. And at the top, you can see we've already warmed the global mean temperature by about 1 degree Celsius, or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, small number. It doesn't sound like much, right? Well, the last time we warmed the global mean temperature by that much, at this time period that I've been studying, we saw, on average, 6 to 9 meters of sea level rise. For those of you Americans in the audience, that's about 20 to 30 feet. So imagine this entire ballroom filled with water up to the ceiling and potentially even higher. In some places of the world, sea level was higher than the 6 to 9 meters. In some places, it was lower. That's an average number. Now, if you think about that late at night, it will keep you awake, right? And the good news is that it's not going to happen overnight. But what this does tell us, not just for this warm period, but all of the other ones that we've studied, we see this repeated pattern, at least 6 meters or 20 feet sea level rise. So that's a repeatable experiment in Earth's history. So it's possible that we're now committed to something like that in the long term, because the polar ice sheets are now e out of equilibrium with the climate that we have today. And that's the important perspective to have in the back of your minds when you're thinking about the pathways towards solutions. So this long-term commitment, even if we do keep our global temperatures at or below 2 degrees Celsius, this number you hear in the media all the time about this target number for climate negotiations, we still may be committed to something like 20 feet of sea level rise. That means, again, that the sea level rise we see today is just the first step in a very long journey, and the coastlines are going to continue to, they're not going to stop at the year 2100, right? You get these numbers for projections of how high sea level will be in the year 2100. It's going to keep going on and on after that. So let's talk about some solutions. I can tell you as a scientist, solutions are not necessarily my expertise, but it does give me a perspective about what aspects may be important to consider in your solutions. One thing is that there's a lot of funding out there for scientists to develop partnerships with communities and stakeholders, and you can't even apply to the program unless you have these connections. So if you're looking for scientists to team with, if you need data about how quickly is sea level rising, how is it affecting our water quality, where is the salt water infiltrating into the aquifers, let that be known and the scientists will come flocking to your doors because we're all looking to make those connections. The most important message, though, I think about solutions that I can give you today is to develop a dialogue within your community about this. Because a lot of people are too afraid about the issue to even talk about it. So use images, and, and when addressing diverse audiences, narratives are paramount. Use stories. And make the issue about human lives. It's something that we can all connect about. People care about not just themselves and their family, their friend, their neighbors their communities, because after all, what the greatest source of wealth in our communities is the people. It's not the physical infrastructure. It is the people and their well-being and their wealth and prosperity that is the most important resource in those cities. The other thing is to make a plan and not to wait until the day after. Otherwise, the disasters are going to control the way in which we retreat from the coastline in the long term. If you would like to have a say in how that retreat occurs, then we need to start talking about the R word that people don't want to use. No one wants to talk about retreat because it's a very scary thing to consider. But in the long term, as a geologist's perspective, there are only two solutions. You build a wall and live in a bowl, or you retreat, because the ocean will eventually win. Sure, there are other shorter-term adaptations and things that we can do to buy us time, 
But in the long term, those are the only two options that we have to us. You can also develop policies that conserve water supplies that will be affected by sea level rise and reduce emissions that will help reduce the total commitment of sea level rise. And importantly, you can control zoning laws to some extent to help focus development along corridors of retreat. If you're explicit about what the risks are for building and developing along coastlines, it might be more attractive to those developers that do think on a longer term horizon to develop in higher areas or areas away from the coastlines. There's a growing number of resources available to you. At first, when people started tackling this issue, there was no playbook for how to go about adapting to sea level rise. Now, there, you can find all kinds of things, not just on the internet, but consulting companies that are sprouting up to help you in this. And they're worth investing in, again, so that there's some kind of plan in place that you can take action on when the time comes. So finally, we need more dialogue again, and I can't emphasize this enough. I feel like when it comes to issues of sea level rise and climate change, that fear takes over people and they don't want to talk about it because it's such a big problem. And I understand that fear. The fear of using the word retreat or even talking about it is scary to a lot of people because we like things the way they are. The problem is it doesn't matter if we want to believe, we want to say we're going to draw a line in the sand, we're not going to retreat, right? Eventually, at some point, we're going to need to do that. And I understand the fear behind the, the using the word retreat and talking about it. Upstairs, I have a magnificent picture window out my bedroom that's looking out over the whole port of Miami and Miami Beach and all of the awesome infrastructure that that entails. I get that on a professional level, I get it on a personal level. I used to have family that lived in South Dade until in the year of 1992, when Hurricane Andrew came through, the eye of the storm passed over their houses and flattened them. And they don't live in the Sunshine State anymore, to say the least. But the point is, I understand retreat on a personal level, and I understand it on a professional level. And it's not an easy thing to anyone to talk about. But if we can't even have the conversation, then we won't be able to collectively do anything about it. So that conversation needs to occur, and not just top down, but bottom up, right? And we also need to convince people at higher levels, because this is a bigger issue. It's going to require buy-in at state and federal levels, because the local communities can't do it all on their own. So we need leaders who are going to be brave enough to tackle these issues that might be longer than political time scales. Many of those leaders are here today who are already dealing with this issue, and I applaud them. They are paving the way for many cities to take the same pathways. You're going to have to become scientists and experiment. It's not going to be the same solution in every city. You're going to have to employ the scientific method and test things that might work. In some cases, they might not. In some ways, they will. Finally, focus on protecting the people in your community rather than the physical community. Because there's no doubt that the physical borders of that community, if you're in a coastal one, will change in the future. But if you make the conversation about protecting the people, they will understand why it's so important, rather than getting this idea into their heads that you need to fight and retain the land that you have now. My last parting thought is that you should never underestimate what a small group of people is capable of. We might be a small group of people here today in this room, relatively speaking, but there are many influential people here today, too. And a lot of the elected officials know how affected small, very vocal groups can be. They get their point across, and they get heard, right? And we can do the same. So I have hope in all of you who now have this perspective on this issue. I have hope in all of us together that we can make a difference in addressing this issue of sea level rise. Thank you.